Would you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12? And just by way of reminder, um, we are still enforcing that the lobby is where um, we would ask that you be masked up. If you, uh, even if you're going out to use the restroom, please take your mask with you. We just want, if those who are um, feeling uh, still the need to be distanced um, from others, we want them to have that place where they can come here, um, but yet still uh, maintain a distance that they feel they need to do uh, for their own uh, protection. So please just mask up, remind your children too as well. Uh, that's just during the service, of course. Once the service is over, um, we'll be moving in and out and so forth. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's read together from verses 4 to 11. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as He wills. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we approach Your Word, we should be very aware of our need of your spirit to illumine this text and to help us to understand and rightly apply. Um, this is no mere book. This is the inspired word of God. It is the mind of God being unfolded for us on the pages of Scripture, and we pray for the ability to understand it, to have the mind of Christ through your spirit. So I pray for your help. I pray for uh, the, the help of your spirit to rightly divide and communicate your word. And I pray for my, all of us here that, that we would have ears to hear and apply your word and to demonstrate the love of God to one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in 1796, the author of the well-known hymn Amazing Grace, John Newton, he wrote a letter to a young lady named Hannah Moore. And he had led Hannah Moore to Christ previously, and she was now teaching the Bible to the poor in a certain area of England called Mendip, England. And so in his letter to her, Newton wrote, quote, I cannot wonder that a sense of the love of Jesus to you should constrain you as it does to devote all your time and talents and influence to your service. Nor do I wonder at the success and encouragement he gives you in your department. Well, she wrote back to Newton, and in her reply, Moore said the following, quote, God is sometimes pleased to work by the most unpromising and unworthy instruments. I suppose to take away every shadow of doubt that it is His own doing. It always gives me the idea of a great author writing with a very bad pen. See, Hannah Moore is describing how we should all feel in ministry. We are nothing but pens, and we are bad pens at that. We are utterly ineffective on our own. Apart from being picked up and written with, we can do nothing. We are powerless to write a single stroke ourselves. Not only that, but what we produce is of such poor quality. However, when we minister in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the great author, the Lord Jesus Christ, can pick us up. And He can use us 
to write that which builds his church and glorifies and exalts him. And he does it so powerfully, so beautifully, that there's simply no way that it can be attributed to us. This should encourage you. And it should motivate you. You should be encouraged because through His Spirit, Christ has gifted you to serve. And it should motivate you because by His Spirit, the Father causes your inadequate efforts to be supernaturally effective in building up His church. And Christ, who is the head of the church, He gets all the glory as the one sovereignly directing the building of His church through powerfully using ordinary people like you and me. So what we've learned so far from chapter 12 is that the Spirit is indispensable for effective New Testament ministry. He is the Christ-exalting Spirit. Without Him, our witness for Christ is vain. Our desire, therefore, is that through the Spirit's power, we can be used by Christ to build up His church and to exalt His name in the earth. We know that Christ wants to use us because He has gifted us individually with abilities through which Christ accomplishes His purposes in the world through the church. We call these spiritual gifts. They're not natural talents. They're not our skills. These are gifts from Christ given through the Spirit and made effective by the Father that allows someone like you and like me to, be, to truly build up another believer in love and to encourage them in their walks, to confront unbelievers with the gospel in the world. See, these gifts, they enable you to exalt Christ in the world. And their purpose is to bring glory to Christ, not to us. And so this morning, we pick up where we left off uh, two weeks ago, looking at the Spirit's Christ-exalting gifts. So this is the second part of a message that we began two weeks ago since uh, last week we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord. And so my goal is to show you that the Spirit distributes Christ's gifts for the edification of Christ's church to exalt the glory of Christ's name in all the world. The Spirit distributes Christ's gifts for the edification of Christ's church to exalt the glory of Christ's name in the world. So while Paul makes sure that all the members of the Trinity are in view, as we saw when we read verses 4 through 6, he makes it clear that he wants to highlight the Spirit's purpose. He mentions the Spirit 11 times in these 11 verses. And Paul puts forward three Sovereign actions of the Spirit that leads to the exaltation and the worship of Jesus Christ in the world. The Spirit distributes Christ's gifts for service in Christ's church. He demonstrates His presence for the good of Christ's church. And He diversifies His activity in the worship of Christ's church. So the first sovereign action of the Spirit is that He distributes Christ's gifts for service in Christ's church. So we see this in verses 4 through 6, which we covered in part 1 of this sermon. Paul here is telling the Corinthians that the Spirit is the one who distributes the variety of gifts to the church on Christ's behalf so that they can serve with supernatural effect in the building up of the church. Such a gift is available to all who have submitted themselves to the Spirit, first through being regenerated by the Spirit at salvation, and then being filled with the Spirit through daily communing with Him in word and prayer. 
We can still serve apart from the Spirit. That's certainly true. However, it's going to be absent of the power to make it effective for Christ's purposes. And that might explain some of the chaos that we see going on in Corinth. The gifts of the Spirit were not used according to the Spirit's desire, which is to glorify Christ. Right? Instead, they were glorifying themselves. The focus was on themselves, not Christ. And so instead of people using their gifts to build up the church, they're abusing their gifts. They're tearing apart the church instead, creating factions instead of unifying believers. So as you look over verses 4 through 6, Pauly, Paul, Pauly, me and, me and Paul, we're on good terms here, Pauly, Paul clearly connects the gifts with the Trinity and no such disunity exists within the Trinity. There's a variety of gifts, but all of them proceed from one source, the triune God. We see that as we read through uh, 8 through 11, over and over again. The Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit is mentioned. Variety of gifts, that's what he's showing us in those verses, which we'll cover today, same Spirit behind all of them. So Paul makes it very clear that the gifts given are different, but the same Spirit gives them. The ministries in which you use those gifts are different, but the same Lord puts you in those ministries. There are different effects from these gifts and ministries, but the same God empowers you. And that being the case, what should that lead us to do? How should we think in light of this? What should we do? Well, we should serve with the gift that the Spirit supplies us. That he gives, right? The word for gifts, it comes from the word for grace. This means these gifts, they're not earned. They're graciously given by Christ through the Spirit. They're not a mark of spirituality as some of the Corinthians were likely making them out to be. They're an extension of Christ's grace that allows us to serve him effectively according to his will and by the Father's power. That's what they are. So we should serve with the gift the Spirit gives. Secondly, we should serve in the ministry the Lord chooses. The word for ministries, it can be translated services. It comes from the same word from which we get our word deacon. It reminds us that spiritual gifts, they're for serving others, not ourselves. We are put into our ministries according to Christ's sovereign purposes. He's the one building the church, so he decides how we serve, where we serve, how long we serve, with whom we serve. You got complaints about who you're serving with? Talk to the Lord of the church, because he's the one who put them there, or put her there. Right? We, don't, we don't go about telling the Lord what we're going to do for him. We're not going to tell the Lord how we, which gifts we're going to use or not. No. He gifts us through the Spirit to serve Him effectively in the ministries that He chooses. Thirdly, we need to serve in the power that God supplies. Your effectiveness in ministry, Paul says, it comes from God. So from Him comes the divine power that produces effects that cannot be attributed to a person. So don't assume those effects are only the more, just the more visible kind, right? Speaking in tongues... Uh, giving sight to the blind, things like that. See, when you're filled with God's Spirit, there is a divine power that flows through the help that you give a hurting brother or sister, through the wisdom shown in speaking the gospel in the face of opposition, through the knowledge imparted as the Scriptures are rightly expounded and explained. You didn't see anything spectacular but the Spirit blew through and you knew His presence was there because Christ was exalted and you know Christ was exalted. You feel uplifted. You feel encouraged. You feel strengthened. You feel motivated and inspired to serve the Lord. The Spirit has been there. The Spirit has been at work exalting Christ as you served in the power of Christ. See, when you serve with the gift that the Spirit gives in the ministry the Lord chooses, and in the power that God supplies, Christ powerfully and effectively uses you to build up His church in love. Christ gets all the glory for this because He's the one who said He's building His church. The Spirit distributes Christ's gifts to exalt the glory of Christ's name in the world. 
So the Spirit distributes a variety of gifts from Christ for use in a variety of ministries which the Lord chooses that produces a variety of effects by the Father's power. And now, in verse 7, which is where we left off, Paul explains how all of this is worked out in the life of the church. He says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So this sentence functions really as Paul's thesis statement for what he's, for what he's laying down here in chapter 12. Amidst all of the ways the triune God distributes these various gifts and ministries and effects, there is one common intent. Paul calls it the common good. And then in verses 8 through 10, right, he's going to give us a representative list of the diverse ways that the Spirit manifests Himself in the worship of the church. So from what Paul says here, he's making known three truths about the Spirit's activity in the life of the church. You can know that the Spirit has gifted you to serve Christ, to profit Christ's church, and to demonstrate His presence. Those three things. Let's take a look at that. Well, first, Paul wants you to know that the Spirit has gifted you to serve Christ. The Spirit saved you to glorify Christ, and towards that purpose, He has sovereignly gifted you to serve Christ. He saved you to glorify Christ, and since that's His goal, He's now given you a gift to which you are to glorify Christ with as you serve. Paul doesn't want you to miss this. He puts it right up front in the sentence, in the emphatic position. He says, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit. So these gifts of the Spirit, they're they're not reserved for the few outstanding overachievers in the church. No, every single Christian, where whoever he may be, regardless of how long he has been saved, possesses a gift from Christ through the Spirit. Now, why do you think he wants you to know this? Why does he want you to know this? Because he, he doesn't want you doubting. He doesn't want you doubting that you have a vital role to play in the body of Christ. As a member of the church, I don't mean like, membership, I mean as a part of the body of Christ, where hopefully you are a member of a local church, Paul says it's like you're, you're a body, you're a part of a body. No part of a body gets to say to another part of the body, it's not important, it's not needed. No part of the body gets to claim they're more special than another part just because they're more visible. In fact, sometimes it's the parts that we cover up that are equally important, if not more important, to the parts that we can see. I cover up my trunk, this whole area, and and we're all glad that I do that, right? I'm over 40. That means you don't want to see this part of my body. No midriffs, anything like that. But yet, try functioning without the muscles of your core. Try functioning without them. You can't even get out of bed without the the muscles that are in your core. They're covered, but they're vitally important. And this is perhaps what was going on again in Corinth. Some were claiming exclusive privileges because they were gifted to speak in tongues. Very visible gift. No one, though, has a monopoly on the Spirit. Remember what Paul said in verse 6? He says, the effects may be different, but the same God who works all things in all persons. So Paul's main point here is that the Spirit works through each member, but works differently in each member. Just as he says down in verse 29, right? He says, all are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? The idea is, of course not. Right? And he keeps going. He makes the same point in Romans 12, verse 3, where he says, God is allotted to each a measure of faith. And again, he says it in Ephesians 4, 7, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. 
And so clearly Paul wants you to know, Christian, that the Spirit has gifted you to serve Christ. How are you serving Him? Are you serving Him? Where are you serving Him? That's a question that you need to answer because He's gifted you to serve. Now, the second thing that you need to know is that the Spirit has gifted you to manifest His presence. The Spirit has gifted you to manifest His presence. So the word for manifestation, it means to make known, to reveal, to disclose. It, it was used in John chapter 7 about Jesus' brothers, right? They didn't believe His claims to be the Messiah. They were ashamed of Him because He was going about the land. And he had a bunch of people following after him, and he was doing these supposed miracles. And they were getting fed up. And so they basically said, you know what, why don't you just go up to Judea, to Jer Jerusalem, just, just show yourself to the world. Just get it over with, Jesus. Show yourself. And that's the word for manifestation. Right? Stop hiding in these, in this backwa these backwater areas and get up to Judea where, where it all matters. Right? Just go and show yourself there. Show the world who you really are, Jesus. So this is the same word, this show yourself. In John 14, when Jesus, um, there he's talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 21 he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and I will disclose myself to him. That's the other word for manifestation here. I will disclose myself to him. So you have these, these two additional uses here of the same word that in our text is translated manifestation. So in one case, it's this outward display. Jesus, go show yourself. Show yourself to the world. In another case, it's a disclosing an inward one to the individual. But in all cases, it involves something being displayed, manifested. The activity goes out such that it affects others. It goes out from Jesus to show the world. It goes out from the Father to disclose himself to us or from, from Christ. So remember, this is in the context of the, of, of the purpose of the Spirit, right? We, had, we started this all off. Now, now, concerning spirituals, right? That which is of the Spirit. That's how the whole chapter begun, right? So it's in the context here of the purpose of the Spirit. What's the purpose of the Spirit? Jesus said, He shall glorify me. So it's all about exalting Christ. That's the purpose of the Spirit. The evidence of the Spirit is the exaltation of Christ. And so Paul is saying that through the gifts... The Spirit's presence is manifested. And it results, therefore, in wherever the Spirit goes, right? What's the result? Christ is ministered in a specific way. He's exalted as the one who ministers to us. He's experienced by those whom you are serving with, this, with the gift Christ had the Spirit give you. So He could minister to them through you. Pick any of the gifts that, that, that Paul lists here that we'll cover here in a minute in 8 through 11. Pick any of them. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing. Because it doesn't matter which one you pick. When you are filled with God's Spirit, the gift, the ministry, the effect, all that may differ. It may differ from one to the next, but not what those you are ministering to ultimately experience they will experience Christ in some tangible manner. Christ is seen through you. He's heard through you. He's felt through you. Spirit causes those to whom you minister to sense Christ. Christ has ministered to them through you. How many times have you, let's say, written a thank you letter to someone who just dropped a meal off to you and you were especially encouraged and you said, I felt like Christ was ministering to me through that meal. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. Because the Spirit of God was at work. That's why that happened. 
This is how Christ intends these gifts that he's given you through the Spirit to work. And that's why we must be filled with the Spirit and submitted to him as we're using them. Oh, we can still do, call, we can be busy. But that type of busyness, apart from the Spirit, you get as far as you get when you're on a treadmill. You go nowhere. You make a whole lot of activity, but you're going nowhere. But when you're filled with the Spirit, you're spirit. You're sprinting. You're running a marathon. You're going places. And that's what we want to be. Not on a treadmill, but going places. The Spirit compelling us. Giving us Christ's compassion. The Father causing tremendous effects that can't be attributed to just, I just made a meal. But I was, I was glad to do it. I, I keep picking the meal idea because it's just that simple. Even a simple meal can be a a minister of Christ, a ministry of Christ to someone who's hurting in that moment. I was just talking with a brother whose wife is laid up. He's always busy, very busy in ministry. And they they were given an opportunity to just get away. And everyone said, we got you covered. And he got away with his wife uh, because she just needed to be separated from everything that was going on around and he said, two families brought us meals. It was so sweet that they would do that. You know, and just to convey that, they just made food. That wasn't what they made. They ministered Christ to him at a time when they greatly needed it. See, you can be used this way. But not if you're gonna, not if you're gonna neglect his word, not if you're gonna do your own thing and go, oh, they need a meal. Yeah, we can do it, we can do it. But you've got to be walking with God's spirit. You've got to say, Christ, I'm yours. I'm yours. Do with me as you will. You need me to serve in the nursery? I'll serve in the nursery. You want me to to minister to the kids? I'll minister to the kids. You want me to open my house for hospitality? I'll open my house for hospitality. I just want to be used of you to, to, to build your church up in love. And that's what happens when you're walking with the Spirit and you're serving in love. Christ is ministered. Now, there's one last thing that you need to know. You need to know that the Spirit has gifted you to profit Christ's church. See, the gift that you have been given by the Spirit, Paul says it's for the common good. It's it's given to profit the church. It should go without saying then that to use the Spirit's gift in any way for your own private purposes or for your own glory is to abuse this ability. The Spirit gives it to you for the common good and to glorify Christ. So don't use it to serve or glorify yourself. Paul says this gift, it is given to you. So that's in the passive sense. All that you did to have this gift is receive it. I mean, you, maybe you didn't consciously go, oh, thank you. You know, you just, you didn't do anything. It was given to you. You weren't even conscious of it. So you certainly didn't earn this gift. It doesn't represent some spiritual accomplishment on your part. So there's nothing to boast about here. There is no glory here for you. And it was given for ministry to others, not personal indulgence or to promote your personal status. In fact, to use the gift the Spirit gives you for your own gratification is selfishness. It's love for self, not love for others. And without love, not only will your ministry accomplish nothing, but as Paul is going to tell us here in 13, he says, not only will you accomplish nothing, he says, you are nothing without love. So you may be able to do good apart from the Spirit, but you can't minister the good of Christ apart from the Spirit. Your good can certainly help, but you know what I really need from you? I need Christ from you. That's what I need from you. The Spirit will do, He'll do that through you as you minister with the gift that He's given to you. And we need to know this, don't we, church? We do. Through you, the Spirit wants to cause people to experience the good of Christ and therefore to bring glory to Christ. So are you using the gift that Christ has given you to minister to the body, the church. Now, I know, I know what you're thinking. I'm not really sure what my gift is. And I keep telling you we're going to get to that. 
there's really nothing to get to. There's really nothing to get to. I, can't, I cannot give you a step one, two, three to know how, how you're gifted. And I think that's part of what we're going to see here as we keep moving through this text. I don't, it, it doesn't matter what your gift is in the ultimate sense. What matters is that you, out of love and in submission to the Holy Spirit, you want to meet needs. So show me where the need is, I'll go meet it. That is how the Spirit works. And in the midst of that, people are going to notice how Christ is ministered effectively through you. And that's how you begin to realize how you're gifted to serve. It's not through taking some personality test. It has nothing to do with your personality. So so set all that stuff aside and start serving. Saying, Lord, I want to be available. I want to be be available to serve in whatever capacity and whatever needs there are. And I trust that if I'm walking with your spirit, you'll use me. And you'll even maybe narrow it down a little bit and show me in what ways I am particularly useful to exalt and glorify and minister you. See, when you you withhold yourself from others, when you, when you basically come here and then we don't see you again until next week and you come here again, right? When that's all that's going on, when you're withholding yourself from others, when you stay on the fringes, when you don't engage with the body, there's no way you can minister to them. You have to be involved. Christ has entrusted this gift to you to... Somebody just airdropped me a picture. So be careful who you're choosing. (laughs) Christ has entrusted this gift to you to build his church. Are you serving with it? Are you withholding it? Like the parables of the talents, right? Remember that parable? God has, he expects you to take what he has given to you and to cause it, to invest it, to cause it to increase in value. He's going to hold us accountable for what He's entrusted to us. And this should stir you. It should stir you from being lazy or self-centered or apathetic or stingy or distracted by other priorities. So stop putting your preferences before Christ and start loving His church. You can't say that you love Christ, but you don't love His church, which He says is His body. It's like telling someone, hey, I love your head, but I hate your body. Christ wants to minister through you to His body in a powerful way. So get busy serving before it's too late. So Paul now gives a sampling of gifts in verses 8 through 11. And he's doing that to illustrate what he's just talked about in verse 7. He's giving us a fairly sizable list of ways in which the Spirit is manifested when the Lord's people are assembled together for worship. And so, in verses 4 through 6, we've we've seen the sovereign actions of the Spirit in His distributing Christ's gifts for service in, in Christ's church. And this demonstrates His presence through the gifts for the good of the church, in verse 7. And now, the Spirit's third sovereign action here is that he diversifies his activity in the worship of Christ's church. He diversifies his activities in the worship of Christ's church. And so when it comes to the Spirit in the church, we've, uh, excuse me, when, so when it comes to the Spirit in the church, we've got the Spirit, right, whose main priority is to exalt Christ in whatever he does. He's sovereignly distributing Christ's gifts He's demonstrating His presence. He's diversifying His activity through different individuals in the church. So, the Spirit is all throughout this. And that's the main thing that Paul is highlighting here throughout this text. Listen to how many times he mentions the Spirit as we read again through verses 8 through 10. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. And to another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, the distinguishing of spirits. 
to another various kinds of tongues and to another the interpretation of tongues. So that's, that's quite a, a diverse list of, I think there's nine gifts there. Now, I don't think Paul is just randomly you know, plucking out gifts that he knows about and then he puts together this list. I think instead what he's done is he's made a list of those gifts that the Corinthians were most enamored with, likely due to their more, maybe their more conspicuous supernatural nature, at least in, in, in a number of these. So these were the gifts that, that drew the people's attention, and so these were the ones that they craved which also suggests that they were the gifts around which they were dividing. Now, there's good reason to think that Paul grouped these gifts according to three categories. What's the reason for this? Well, over and over, as you notice here, he repeats the word another. Another, another, another. So, in Greek, there is a word that means another of the same kind, And then there is another word in the Greek that means another of a different kind. In our English, all you're seeing is the word another. But in fact, six times Paul uses the Greek word for another of the same kind. And then two times he uses the word for another of a different kind. And many scholars say that this this change in word choice marks what they would say is Paul dividing up, making a different category of gifts here. So if we follow this idea, Paul starts in verse 8 with two gifts, the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. Both of these are revelatory gifts that entail insights having been given to the mind. They involve something being imparted in one way or another by direct revelation And the idea would be that God gifts a person to be a channel used by God to convey his mind and his instructions to the church. And so the word of wisdom or knowledge is ultimately ultimately spoken to the church. But then at the beginning of verse 9, Paul says, again, he says, to another, at the beginning of verse 9 there, to another faith, he starts off. But this word for another is the word for another of a different kind. So this could indicate a new category that includes the next five gifts that that Paul mentions here that are all apparently of of a similar kind. Faith, gifts of healing, effecting of miracles, prophecy, and distinguishing of spirits. And some scholars see these as a random, maybe they're just a random set of supernatural gifts. Um, Paul knew that these were the ones that they were craving in Corinth. That's why he's mentioned them there. He's grouped them in this fashion. Others, though, believe that that Paul, uh, that apart from their, you know, each of them has a supernatural component to them and a function that's supernatural, like healing someone who is sick, but that each of these gifts were ultimately designed to validate the authority of the word of wisdom and the authority of the word of knowledge. In other words, it it lent authority, It, it, it validated the person or what was spoken by means of this other gift that was clearly supernatural. So they certainly revealed divine power in and of themselves, but they, none of these conveyed any sort of a direct message, these five that, were, that we just mentioned. Um, one exception there that, that we'll look at, not necessarily today, but moving forward, is the idea of prophecy. How does that fit into this group? But for now, we're just looking at the possibility of how Paul has has grouped these things. So imagine, how would these be of of a confirmatory nature? How would this work? How How would they validate a word of wisdom or of knowledge that was spoken? Well, imagine you have a group of people doing things that are indisputably miraculous, such as completely healing someone that you know had been an invalid for years or someone, let's say, who was prone to fits, falling down and going into convulsions and then this guy comes along and casts out a demon from him in Jesus' name and he's fit and he's, I mean, he's, he's in his right mind now. And you know the contrast because you've seen this individual. So imagine that's a scenario that's going on and you're standing back amazed at what you're seeing and then someone stands up and says, can I have your attention? 
I want to explain what you've seen here. You've witnessed the power of God. And this God has something to say to you. Well, you've, you've clearly seen the power of God. Wouldn't you want to hear now what's about to be said? See, it, it, if, if that is followed then by a proclamation of some nature, these are confirmatory. They, they validate the person and what they're about to say. You'd be compelled to listen. You've clearly witnessed something wonderful that you can't explain by any sort of natural means. Now, after these five verses are... All the, um, they're all separated by the same word, right? You see it again. Um, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the Spirit. To another, the effect of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing of spirits. All of those others mean another of the same kind. And then after distinguishing of spirits, he says to another, and in that case, he uses the other word, another of a different kind. And again, they're saying, okay, this is a third category, potentially, right? This it includes the, the problem child, right? Tongues, speaking in tongues. And also its companion, the interpretation of tongues. So the gift of tongues, Paul uh, is later going to say in chapter 14, he says it functions as a sign to unbelievers. And so that suggests that these gifts are of a similar nature to the second group, but Paul may have just set aside tongues because he knows that that's really the one that they're most enamored with. So not only does he make it third, um, or lowest in the list, right? He's putting it at the end of the list, but he's putting it in a category by itself. And so these are different from the other five that we were just talking about, but, but uh, the second, um, these, these, these in the, the tongues and the interpretation of tongues, it's... Um, None of the, uh, the tongues does not readily involve, as we'll look at here in a minute, the mind being engaged. All these others more have the volition of the will involved, going to up to a person, speaking to a person, laying hands on a person, you know, things of that nature. But tongues did not involve the mind. You could be speaking and not knowing what you were saying. And so when Paul zeroes in on tongues later in chapter 14, he says that, the one who speaks in tongues, he speaks mysteries in his spirit. In other words, he may, he may not understand the very things that he's saying in a language he doesn't even understand. Now, how certain am I that this is how we should categorize these nine gifts? Uh, the different words for another, they, they clearly suggest these categories, but I'd have to say I'm not entirely sold on the definition of, of these categories. And so we'll, we'll be looking not so much at the categories, but at the function of the gifts, just understanding what they are. But as we move down the road, of course, we, we have to bring all this together and begin to say, okay, what's, what's the overall purpose of these gifts and how they're, they're functioning or not functioning today? So we're not going to cover that topic today. Uh, but is this a way to group and understand what Paul has laid out for us? Yes, it's, it's a possibility. There could be a more just a simple logical uh, organization of these. So that doesn't matter so much, but that's just helping us to get into the mind of Paul and how he's laying things out. So there's more here to think about. But what I, want, what I think is, is important to understand is, is that it's not Paul's purpose here to identify the precise nature of these gifts. We're the curious ones. We're wondering, what is distinguishing of spirits? Right? We're wondering about that. We're the curious ones. However, I think what we can know for sure is that what Paul was writing to the Corinthians, they knew what he was talking about. We have to work a little bit harder to try to understand what he's talking about, whereas the Corinthians knew what Paul was talking about. So Paul doesn't go into, a, he doesn't go into hardly any explanation here. Of this, So we, it's a lot of effort to try to piece from, this, from different parts of Scripture what, what that gift really may be functioning as. And that, you know, that, what that does, that helps, us, that helps us to think rightly about the gifts. You know, it's not so important that you know how you're gifted. What matters is that you are gifted to serve and you need to be serving. Right? The fact that, that we haven't been educated from the Scriptures explicitly of what, what each of these 
these uh, gifts are and how they function, that tells us something. We don't need to know that. What we need to know, he has told us, to each one, right? You have been gifted to serve. Um, this is not a complete list it's not an exhaustive list uh, he gives other lists in, Roman tw- in Romans chapter 12 and Ephesians chapter 4 so while all these gifts are supernatural in their function and they manifest the Spirit's presence it's not necessarily true that they are all equally spectacular right? these though are the, are the typical gifts that Paul knew to be relevant to Corinth And most of them, at least six out of nine, are related to speech. And of the nine, tongues and their interpretation, again, it's listed last. Um, Compare this to how in the Gospels, whenever like a list of apostles was given, whose name was always last? Judas. That was intentional. right? He was put last. And in the same way, each time Paul lists in 1 Corinthians, he, he makes a list, he puts tongues last. So he's making it clear to the Corinthians, it's not what you think it is. You're not using this in the way that God intends. So we should understand as Paul was, it's way, his way of saying that this is far less significant than what you're making it out to be. And maybe uh, it should not be as exalted as you're making it out to be. So I suppose it would also be true that Paul, li- uh, that Paul lists maybe the most important gifts first. Right? So if he's putting the least ones last and, and he's putting the most important ones first, then we see the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge is right up front. And these two gifts are closely related to the message that is delivered by the apostles and the prophets and the teachers. And it's, it's the ministry of the word that most benefits the church and strengthens its mission to exalt Christ in the world. That's what matters most. So in the time that we have left, let me just cover a few of these gifts. I don't know if I'll get through all of them. So the word of wisdom and of knowledge, uh, these are closely related. I'll define both um, the word of wisdom and knowledge together in this sense. Both wisdom and knowledge are spoken. They're spoken of throughout Scripture, right? So, so neither wisdom or knowledge in and of themselves are necessarily spiritual gifts, right? Uh, wisdom is all over the Scriptures, being told we should, we should be wise. So this is not what he's talking about. This is a divine gift. It refers to the revealing of God's message of wisdom that would otherwise be unknown. And so what qualifies them as spiritual gifts is that this is, a far, is far more than just wisdom for living, wisdom for life. It's the revelation of God's mysteries for the benefit of his church. So as you may recall, Paul had a, a lot to say about wisdom in the first two chapters of this letter. The world sees Christ crucified as a foolish message when in fact Paul calls it what? He calls it the wisdom of God. And that is what he came preaching. He came preaching the wisdom of God. Christ crucified. He calls it a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. This is 1 Corinthians 2, 6. He says, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. So this is referring to a wisdom that was before unknown, that had to be preached. But before it could be preached, it had to be revealed. So Paul and the other apostles were God's divine mouthpieces to reveal this hidden wisdom about Christ and the cross. The word of wisdom, it seems to be the spirit-given ability Christ gave to these early church leaders to take the divine revelation of the gospel, transform it into words which they then preached and taught to others of their generation. It's the supernatural ability to receive and communicate this special revelation. I think Paul refers to it when he says, We received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things, right? That's the first part. We may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom. No man taught us this, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts and spiritual words. So we know that throughout the history 
of the Bible, there have been strategic moments where God has spoken directly to his servants so that they can convey his message to his people. And I think we can all agree that the period following Pentecost was just one such strategic era, if not the most. The church needed to understand never before revealed truths, which Paul calls mysteries, so that they can fulfill their mission to make disciples of Christ in all the nations. So the Lord accomplished this by giving this spiritual gift of wisdom to certain first-generation Christians. Much of what, what God revealed to the apostles, it became part of God's written revelation, which we have right now in Scripture here, in the Bible, our Bibles. And we can assume that God probably also revealed many other things that were only for temporary, of temporary usefulness, and none of that was captured. Paul, of course, had this spiritual gift of wisdom, uh, Peter recognized it when he wrote uh, in 2 Peter 3.15. He said, Just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. And so as Christians, God has promised to give us wisdom when we ask for it. Such wisdom, though, is not the same as the word of wisdom, which is a gift. The word of knowledge is closely related to wisdom. While the word of wisdom involves direct revelation, the word of knowledge was the ability to grasp the revealed truth and by means of the Spirit's inspiration, apply it to the various connections in which God has already revealed. It's the spiritual gift of, sp of, of special insight and applications from the Scriptures to situations that the church was facing, like the Scriptures that already existed. Right? Paul shows this revelatory gift by linking it to prophecy in 1 Corinthians 13. 2. He says, if I had the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, right? So within the idea of prophecy is mysteries and knowledge, right? This gift along with, with um, the gift of apostle is what enabled these men to communicate the message of Christ with such authority, tying in Old Testament verses that declare who Christ is, right? It was all of this being put together in this gift of knowledge, Paul makes it clear that the word of wisdom, it was through or it was by the Spirit. The Spirit is the one through whom these mysteries were revealed to his apostles and prophets. And similarly, the, world of, the word of knowledge is according to the same Spirit. And this shows us that the, that the knowledge this gift enabled these church leaders to gain, it was perfectly aligned with the will of the Holy Spirit. So whether the revelation was direct from God or whether it was derived from the scriptures that they had, both were divinely given by the Spirit to those whom he gifted. Right? They were the ones putting it all together, preaching it, writing it, displaying Christ for who he was. And it was by virtue of these two gifts. Now, the first gift then, this would be the first gift in this second category, is the gift of faith, but we're going to have to stop there. I could cram, what is it, <laughs> seven other verses in four minutes, and I don't think that would do anybody any good. So why don't we... Um, let me just give some concluding thoughts here, though. Um, what Paul talks about here in this list, it's not exhaustive. It's representative of the types of spiritual gifts. There are other lists, as I mentioned, and none are exactly the same. And so this would suggest that we're not... We're not called necessarily to put hard and fast labels on these gifts. What matters, as I said, it's not necessarily what gift you have. What matters is are you serving in the power of the Holy Spirit? Your gift is not about you. It's about Christ. It's about glorifying Him, serving Him, advancing His purposes. So when you're serving in His church, in the name of Christ, in the power of the Spirit, you are advancing His kingdom. You are building up His church in love, and that's what matters. For all that we don't understand about the gifts, that much we do know. And what serves and glorifies Him is that you recognize that Christ has made you a part of His body. He's gifted you to serve His body. You have a vital role in building up and unifying the body of Christ. And this is where Paul goes next. He uses, 
he uses the word one 13 times in chapter 12 because it's in the midst of this chaos and this disunity. He wants them to be unified. He's emphasizing the unity of the body of Christ and how gifts should work towards this end. A, a distinguishing stranger once had the opportunity to hear Thomas Chalmers. He was the leader of the Free Church in Scotland in the 1800s. A man who greatly admired Chalmers. He came up to this stranger who was visiting. He asked him after, afterwards, he said, he said, what do you think of Dr. Chalmers? And the man replied, think of him? Why, he, he made me think so much of Jesus, I didn't even think of him. That's, that's what needs to be true with how we serve. The aroma, the flavor of Christ is what is left behind. Not whatever we may have done. We serve to bring glory to Christ, not ourselves. We serve with Christ's gifts, distributed by Christ's Spirit for the good of Christ's church to exalt the glory of Christ's name in the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, that is our desire. May it motivate us to see you glorified in the world. May it motivate us to get off the sidelines or to push ourselves even more to be serving you in your church, to serve one another, to build up the body of Christ in love in the hopes that through our inadequate efforts, you, the great author, might pick up us these bad pens and write something beautiful and glorious that brings, that brings you all the glory you deserve. Oh, we love you. Draw us closer to yourself. Let us seek first your kingdom. Let us put you first in our lives and in serving you and know that you will be glorified and we will be satisfied in this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you please stand and sing this last song?